Okay, people. Um, here we go. Here I am in my little room in Santa Fe. I've got sun coming in the east window in the morning and the sun going down in the afternoon. I'm very fortunate. It's very pleasant. Okay, sweetie pie, all you people, I'm very happy to see you all. Um, okay, good. So then tell me what's going on. I mean, I can tell you a few things. One of the biggest things that I've been thinking about lately, and we talked about it last week somewhere else, and I talked about it on Facebook, and it's the hardest one for us, but it's absolutely fundamental. It's the basic, it's like, you know, it's the relationship between it's it's the real meaning of compassion okay to understand and it's quite it's actually quite hard for us you know um and and this is this is so this is the relationship you know how i talk all the time about a bird needs two wings you know it's a really perfect analogy and it covers all aspects of buddhist practice and also it covers the kind of orderly the orderly way of Buddhist practice. You know, like I say all the time, we know that, you know, when you study math or music, you kind of, you go to the simple stuff, the middle stuff, and then the advanced stuff, and then you graduate. But we're not used to thinking of spiritual teachings like that. And we certainly don't think of developing compassion like that. You know, we kind of, we say the word compassion. Lots of people love the idea of compassion and have very big hearts and cry when they see suffering and this kind of thing. But the Buddhist view of compassion goes to quite deep levels. But the point here I want to make, you know, like if we take the wisdom wing and the compassion wing, the wisdom wing is like junior school and high school. It never stops, but that's the beginning stages of practice. We have to first learn about yourself, learn about your own mind, learn about your own misery, learn about your own suffering, and then how to change it. That's the first job because it's in general, it's pretty true. You can't help if you're, if like say, you know, in any say in anything, like let's say health, let's say nutrition, if you are really unhealthy, you don't eat properly, and you don't know anything about nutrition, think about this. You, how can you help other people with nutrition problems? It's sort of obvious. If you can't play music, how can you help other people play music? If you can't, you know, if you don't know math, how can you help other people with math? Well, that's the point here. Now, we love the idea of helping people, but we don't think of it as having any relationship to any work we do ourselves. We just think of it as some static thing. I see poor people, I want to help them. But we don't think there's any learning we have to do first. But that's the Buddha's point. So the general help we're talking here is, you know, you look at the world, you see people are angry, people are depressed, people are suffering, people are poor, whatever. But the, the only compassion we tend to have, first of all, is for the poor people, for the harmed people, for the terrorized people, for the children, for the animals who are the innocent victims. So this is a kind of a... It's a heavy word, but I'm saying it purposely. So we do have compassion, but we don't think it has, I've got to do work on myself first, but that's the point I'm going to get to here. So first of all, our compassion is limited. It's only for, for these victims. It's only for look what you see a little dog being kicked and then you see the guy who does the kicking. You see a child being abused and you see the abuser. You see one group of people who are poor and you, and you look at all the rich people who take advantage. You see the people who are innocent and who get bombed. We're always seeing it in terms of victims and then the harmers, isn't it? So we have compassion for the victim, but then immediately we have anger towards the harmer. That's just the way we are. You know, we're always looking for the for who it is, is the problem. Who is the blame? Where's the person who caused the problem? That's the way that we think. That's how we think, you know. So in one level, it's true. There is a man who kicked the dog. There is a child who got abused. There are poor people who get taken advantage of. It's true. It's true. But the Buddhist view of compassion goes to deeper levels and this is and this is the point here until you've done certain level of work on your own mind it is impossible to have this level of compassion so for example just talking to somebody recently he's a buddhist right a friend of mine and telling me about this particular fellow who was a, a serious chronic liar i mean that's a particular kind of suffering isn't it where people really tell like the most bizarre lies you know seriously lying serious every word out of his mouth was a lie and you could look at you could see it if you look into it you could see it was all about his arrogance and he was trying to be a better person he really uh, sort of put himself up high you could see he had real problems so then um, we were, i was talking we were discussing this very discussion with this friend of mine and the buddha's whole point is this the very first level of practice you know, the wisdom wing is you, you learn about what the buddha calls the four noble truths which is buddha's very first teaching and it's a general teaching and it, can, it applies to everybody. But obviously, if you're wanting to learn about Buddhism, you want to learn about it for yourself. 
you know, not just, oh, look at all the suffering out there. Buddha's talking to you, honey. He's trying to tell you about your suffering. And this is the part that we find difficult. So let's just say you're not poor and you're not terrorized and you're not raped. Then you think, well, I'm not suffering. And what does that mean? That means we've only got a certain understanding of a certain level of suffering. But the point that Buddha is making, and we start to look more deeply into it, is that we've got these deeper levels of suffering and they exist where? In our mind. So the Buddha's view is very simple. You've heard this a thousand times. You know, what goes on in our mind is the main source of our happiness and our suffering. First of all, that's quite shocking because we're convinced it's the, the thing outside, but this is Buddha's very specific approach. So therefore, if we want to understand Buddhism and try to practice, we have to learn to know about our mind. So then we're going to st he's going to start pointing out, well, honey, you've got things called attachment and anger and jealousy and depression. And you go, wow, I recognize those. And then you'll go, yeah, they're really horrible. They are really suffering. They're really awful. You know, we know they're suffering. But part of our problem is with the ordinary analysis of the world, we sort of tend, uh, we think, well, what do you mean I'm suffering? No, nah, that's not suffering. I'm just, and then we get guilty. And then we feel, then we beat ourselves up. Oh, I'm just, you know, I've got a nice husband. I've got good kids. I've got a job. Why am I complaining? So we don't even, we, then we just want to point fingers at ourselves or get mad at ourselves or blame everybody else. But the first thing that we have to do that when the shift, shifts really start to happen is when we can start to see the mind, our mind, and see the anger and the fears and the jealousy. I mean, you, you know these words. If you listen to me, it's all I ever talk about. I feel like a fraud. It's all I ever talk about. Well, this is Buddha's teachings. So all Buddha's telling us is this. Hey, honeys, yes, it's true. Your husband beating you is suffering. And yes, it's true. The person who just stole your money, it's called suffering. And yes, the, you know, the bad things, people doing bad things to you. But there's a deeper level of suffering. The deeper level of suffering is these very states of mind themselves. This is the part we all hear it, but you know, we tend to get guilty about it or we, we, we know it's suffering or we know it's suffering, but we blame somebody else for it. So kind of, we try to get off the hook. So the real point of real, the wisdom wing practice is really beginning to know our own minds and with kindness to ourselves, seeing the pain of these states of mind. And the words are very simple, but we find it very hard, you know. So what's the point of this? How can this help me get compassion? This is the point now. Now, you check your own life. You check your life. You know you're not a saint. That means you've got anger and passion, depression and jealousy. And that means you also know your relationships with other people. Now, you might also, you might, if you're the person who's always being abused by somebody else, it's very hard to see, isn't it, that you might do something to other people. But let's just say, if you look at yourself very honestly, since you're a little child, we can see we have done a few things, maybe not as bad as your boyfriend. It's right. You don't go around shouting and screaming. Maybe you don't. And often we really, but this is the part that's hard to see. In fact, many of us really believe we don't do anything wrong. We've got anger, we've got depression, but we're a nice person. But no, we never harm others. It's just not true. If you have to look with honesty at ourselves, anything, even a fight you had with your sister when you were 10, you shouted at her, you got hurt or something. You know, I mean, there's some, there's some things we've done that even if out of lack of wisdom, we've made a mess of a relationship. We haven't understood how to be wise. That, and so then check, what is it in, going on in your mind when you do those things? Well, it's not love. It's not compassion, it's not wisdom, it's not kindness, it's the other states of mind. It's the fears and the jealousy and the low self-esteem that only seem to harm you, know, that harm you, but they are why you make a mess of your life. They're why you do anything that's a mess that, that anybody, even a tiny bit that somebody else gets a result of, you know, maybe because when you're very depressed, you can't think of anybody else, can you? I mean, it's not, it's not criticizing yourself, but even just if you're very depressed, it feels like you're harming nobody but yourself. But you're also harming other people because you don't even notice other people. You're completely self-centered. So what I'm saying is these delusions are why we suffer and they are why we do anything at all that makes a mess of our relationships. So what I'm getting at is when you can own your anger and your depression and your fears and your jealousy and the actions you do with your body and speech on the basis of those, which are the actions that harm others, even a small amount. Now you know why you make a mess of your relationship because of your delusions. So now you mightn't be a chronic liar like this fellow, but you can now look at this fellow and go, and you see his actions and they are harming other people, but you know where they're coming from, his mind. 
So that means you can have a space for compassion for him, but you cannot have that compassion. This is my friend who we we're discussing it. He said, oh, but he enjoys it. But I said, that's part of that. Well, I didn't say, but this is the point now. Of course, when a person is really angry, they look like they're loving being angry. A person who's violent looks like they love being violent. A person who's sadistic really gets pleasure from it. A person who lies really looks like they're getting pleasure. And so we go, ha ha, what do you mean have compassion for them? They enjoy what they're doing. They do it on purpose. Well, yes, but that's the suffering. That's the point. That's what suffering is. But you will never see this person as suffering until you've seen your own mind. That's the point. What you'll do is you'll point fingers, how evil he is, look at how bad he is, look at those bad people, look at those rapists, look at those terrorists. We point fingers as if we are innocent and we've never done a single thing wrong and we think everybody else is wrong. This is the commonest thing on the planet. Look at everybody. We never stop criticizing. We never stop criticizing the world, pointing fingers at the politicians, moaning, complaining about this. Look at these bad people. Look at these evil people. Look at these racists. Look at these murderers. Look at these psychopaths. But we don't see it as suffering. We just see, are they bad? Which is called criticism. I mean, this is hard to hear because they are harming other people. No one's saying they're not. They are harming other people. But what what part of their mind is functioning when you harm other person? You've either got anger, jealousy, resentment, bitterness, or love and kindness. Now, if love and kindness is prevalent in your mind, you don't harm anybody. If there's anger and jealousy, then you harm people. So what's the reason people harm people? Because they're suffering with anger and jealousy. But you won't know that that's suffering until you know your own. That's the very simple point. And then you will not find fault in others. You'll see the problem, but you'll have compassion. Now, this is the other point. Compassion is not, we just think of it as some sentimental thing, you know, or oh, like, as if, you know, you say, well, that guy's beating up that guy. Oh, I'm supposed to have compassion for the guy beating up. Then you think I'm supposed to say, oh, well, the poor fellow can't help it. He's suffering because that's how we think in our culture. When, you know, we, we always try to find a reason that gets the harmer off the hook. Like, you know, you might have a boyfriend who's abusive. But then you say, oh, well, I have compassion for him because he was abused when he was a child. And that's why he's abusing now. And so the assumption is you've got to let the guy off the hook. No, that's the wrong assumption as well. So it's a, quite a minefield. But we've got to think these things through really carefully, you know. So when you, the more you understand your own mind, the more you see that the suffering it causes you, the more you see that that's why you make a mess of your relationships, the more, if you like, they don't sort, say it this way, but we, should, we can say it this way, the more compassion, the more softness, the more kindness you have towards yourself because you now understand the problem. Then on the basis of this, you look at the world and go, oh my God, look at all those crazy human beings harming each other, thinking thinking that it's okay to do it. And this is the point, the real point behind all of this is the view of karma, which is that we, as Mary said at the beginning, quoting Lama Zopa, you know, our, that we can mold our mind to whatever shape we like. And that's what we're doing every day. So what kind of mind do you think that maniac, that liar, that rapist, what kind of person do you think they are turning themselves into? And that's the part where almost like, and I'm not using this word lightly, we are so disconnected from this bare fact that Buddha says that we create ourselves moment by moment by moment but we are so obsessed with the outside world we think there's innocent victim and the outside world makes me into this kind of person that's demented that's demented let me yes you would sometimes say we're schizophrenic and that's, that's a good way to put it like, like as if we get you know we're just an innocent victim we don't do anything no it's not my fault no no people did this to me and my mother did this and they did this and they did this every we do everything in our power to not look inside you know we are the person who creates ourselves. So when we know that, you can't bear the thought of your anger and your jealousy because you know you're turning yourself into something. You don't feel guilty, but you use it as a skill to help yourself mold yourself into a marvelous person. It's sort of like you know perfectly well if every time you put your finger in the fire, you get harmed. You don't want the suffering. You don't get guilty about it. You just get the lesson and stop putting your finger in the fire. Well, the Buddha says we can turn ourselves into whatever person we like. It's up to us, you know. So when you have this self-respect and kindness towards ourselves, who wants to turn themselves into an angry, depressed, neurotic, miserable person? Don't be guilty, but take it as a wake-up call. And when you know you turn yourself into the person you become and you own this, which is the view of karma, then you can have compassion for the person that this person, this maniac is turning himself into, the unbearable suffering he's causing himself. This is when we begin to have real compassion for the harmers 
for the neurotic ones, for the meanies, for the, for the crazies, not just the innocent victims. But this just takes time. Even as Buddhists, we still don't get this point, you know. So it really takes time to own our own minds, to see the pain we cause ourselves. This is the point, you know. And then when we do see it, we get guilty instead and start beating ourselves up. And that's completely the wrong view, completely the wrong approach, you know. So I don't know, I want to talk about that. I want to say that. So now not, I'd like you to ask me some questions now about this in particular, if you like, because it's hard. It's really, really difficult, especially when you're in a relationship with a mean person and you're the one who's the victim and they're the one who's bullying and mean and nasty all the time. It's really hard to see this. That's right. The conversation, this conversation came up, I think, especially last week, I think, in one of our Romanian teachings, when one guy, I don't think he's here today, doesn't matter, even if he is, we talked about it you know, living with his mum. And this is a whole other dimension. I mean, you know, since the pandemic, so many people go back to their mum's houses and then your mum's neurotic. So all you do is you shout and yell and blame your mother. So this guy, you know, his mother's crazy. She's an alcoholic. She's mean. She's manipulative. She might be. Yeah, everybody, I agree. But all he can see is how terrible she is. So the first point I brought up was, I mean, you're a full grown man and you don't pay the rent and he does all the food. Well, you, you know, in a sense, you get what you deserve. But this is so typical in some cultures. Again, this is against men now, I'm sorry, boys. Well, not boys, as girls too, but especially men, boys, sons, living in his mum's house. She does all the work. The poor thing, she's never been honoured all her life. She's in one of these cultures, you know, probably where you just, you're seen as the mother, you're nobody. I said, whose house is it? He said, well, it is my house, meaning his, his father, probably his father left and gave him the house. And there's poor mum who's nobody doing all the work. And she's an alcoholic. So, but I mean, he couldn't because he hasn't looked enough at his own mind. He can't see her suffering. All he sees is his evil mother. This is so common for us. Look at the world. Look at all of us. It's so common. It's hard to see the person in front of you who is neurotic, who is manipulative, who is demented. But it's hard to see it's called suffering because all because you haven't seen your own mind enough. This is the point. This is why the wisdom wing has to come first. It has to. So ask me some questions, you people. Come on. Or any old question you like. And everybody recognizes what I'm saying. You know, when I talk about this boy and his mother, I know some of you here have had the same discussions, you know. Skylar, yes, talk to us, darling. I was wondering if you could go into um, a little bit of like how we still um, show compassion and kind of interact with people, but not go into the idle chatter and gossip, like where, like, Oh, yeah. I understand, Scarlett. Yes, it's, yes, it's difficult, isn't it? When somebody else wants to rab it on about nothing and rave, rave, rave. And, it's, and it can be sounding like you're very rude if you don't talk. So this is where you've got to, you know, I mean, it depends. I mean, if it's, if it's the person you live in your house, you never stops talking. It's quite difficult. It's quite hard, you know. So you just got to be kind. You see, the thing is, you know, you it doesn't mean you, you know, you can, as long as you're aware of what's happening and you're trying to be as kind as you can to this person, you can't force them to talk about proper things. So you let them do whatever they like, but you just try to be kind and listen. And, but, but in your own mind, you don't kind of buy into it all. You just try think of yourself as being kind to this person, you know, I mean, and then that could be quite tough sometimes because maybe you've got to say, Oh God, I've got to go now. And you look at your clock and say, see you later. And you close the door or you close the phone, you know, and that's the tough part that sometimes then you feel like you're being rude, but you've got to have some courage to do that. Because there's no benefit, but it's not to be afraid of it. Let the person wrap it on. You can't stop it. But you can just be kind by listening, I think, isn't it? But then also to be firm. I've got to go now, you know. Don't tell them off or anything. Because it's your, it's your, you're trying to protect your mind, you know, and as well as you can be kind to them. What do you think, Sky? That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, darling, good. Anybody else? Talk to me. Ask questions, anything. No? Something. About anything, I don't mind. I just talked about that other business before because it came up. Anything at all, people? I have a question. <clears throat> yes, Cynthia, sweetheart, talk to me. Hello there. Hi. hi. Yes. Um, when we... <clears throat> When we catch ourselves doing that kind of thing, for example, today, during the, a dialogue with a friend of mine, um, uh, I, 
after I caught myself in my ego and, uh, you know, <clears throat> talking about healthy and stuff that what I do. And I think, oh, yeah, you're fine. Like, <laughs> I'm a lot. I'm a bit lost, Cynthia. Tell, ask the question. I'm a bit yeah. lost. Okay. So the question is, I noticed that I I didn't have any compassion and for this I, person. If for the person, okay. And, uh, and uh, you know, he's anti-vac, anti-vaccination, and okay. all those things. And I start to, oh, I'm not judging you. I said that, <laughs> and of oh, course, yeah. why is it was judging a lot. So, what's the question? Do you think? What's the question? The question from is, what's the learning from this? Uh, uh, the learning from this is my ego can puff it up and become a balloon, a balloon fast. A, a huge ego. And uh, another thing is, um, is that enough if I do, um, a, if I regret? No, okay. So, so first of all, we've got to be, I think to say the word ego is too broad. We've got to be more specific, Cynthia. So if you're so, you, it's sort of like you just played the piano and then you're analyzing your piano playing later. You've got to be more specific about the problems. So in this case, what happened was this guy had opinions that was you felt were very narrow-minded and you got angry. You got annoyed with him. Well, annoyed is a polite word for anger. So you got angry with him and you were criticizing him and thinking he was stupid. So what you've got to do is look at what part of your mind, because you know, the Buddhist view lists the different states of mind. We know these very well. So the parts of your mind that were mainly functioning were anger, irritation, finding fault. And then that's based on attachment, which is the basic one, that he wasn't saying what you wanted. He didn't agree with you. So it's attachment and anger. They're the voices of ego. So it's, it's good to be more specific. So it's attachment. So that means, you know, and then, and then anger. And anger, the best antidote to anger, of course, is called patience, which means trying to listen to what a person says without having too much of an opinion. But we all automatically have an opinion. That's our trouble. You Immediately as he's talking, you're already verbalizing in your own mind your view about what he's saying. But sometimes just let the guy talk and we don't have to have an opinion. This is quite profound sometimes. Just listen. If he's a friend, you know, let him say what he wants to say. Oh, really? Is that what you think? How interesting. Well, what a, look at the sun. Isn't it a lovely day? You don't have to have an opinion. But anger or always wants an opinion so that's the way to learn about it and somehow then, let the person this is again with Skylar let the person say what they want and just listen you know be kind but you don't have to sit there for five hours and let him rave on like a maniac you can also go well I've got to go now but we don't always have to have an opinion because that's when we get upset when we when we kind of dive into the conversation and start going back and forth that's when the problem starts but we always feel we have to do that. That's quite profound, not to have an opinion. Just let him talk. That's yeah, it. And he was not even um, talking that much. He just said, and I... I, mean, I know, but that's, that's, that's the piece. Of, that's the learning for you, I would say. Mm -hmm. And we all understand this one. Absolutely, Cynthia. Thank you so I much. I was, much. whoa. <laughs> of course, that's good. So that's the learning, yeah. Just to say ego isn't enough. It's too broad. You've got to be more specific, darling. Ah, okay. More analytical, more precise with your mind. That's the point. It's one of the roommates, right? That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Thank so you. what else, people? What else? Anything else? Anyone else? A question, a point? Anything? Yes, Pia? No. Pia, hello, sweetheart. Happy yeah. to see you. Happy to see you. Hello, Robina. Thank you. Um, well, actually, tight, off topic completely, but it's been a, been a question of mine for a while. Um, I'm... We're in the, 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 the understanding of karma and... and rebirth and all that stuff um does ancestor spirit beings that notion of yeah. our ancestors and yes. spirit connections yes. and no, all that no power. no so the, the buddha's view would be the connection isn't through the the ma it's 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 you know okay it's not a connection isn't through the family. That's the external way of putting it. You're going back through the family. All the risk means is that you've got some karmic connection with those particular people, but it's not anything to do with ancestors. Nothing. There's no connections like okay. that. It's like, you know, that you've got karma with those people from another life. They might've been, you could have been had karma with them as two dogs 47 lives ago. You might've had karma with them in a completely different scenario, but there's no such way of thinking that we inherit. Or for example, there's no karma is personal through the mind, not through family lines. It's through our own individual minds, you know? So it's quite different. Does that make and sense? Is, 
It, it does. Thank you, Venerable Rubino. And, and is it possible that in their death, I mean, basically the notion of having um, spirit tribes and no, high energy like beneficial that. beings and all that jazz, is that... No, say a bit more so I can be very clear. Well, with I mean, in the law of the... Uh, I'm floating around in the coaching space that is kind of very much sort of law of attraction and manifestation and things like that. And they talk very much about um ancestor lines and you've you've got your your spirit tribe your spirit guides some of them being you know ancestors grandparents great okay you mean spirits from from your grandmother oh, sort of thing. It's, how, how does that fit or does okay. it are you talking here about somebody sees their grandmother and the grandmother advises them or something and she's a spirit is that, that what you're whether they physically see them as an entity or yeah. do meditations where they perceive okay. they are connecting their okay, 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 okay 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 so the buddha's view as you know there are different realms of existence we've yeah. got the humans but then we've also got the animals we've also got the the god realms for example so you know i think when christians or people talk about guardian angels they could be those so they can be quite okay. benign these beings are living in a certain kind of realm of subtlety of enormous joy and bliss but they're not necessarily holy but some of them could be helpful and they have maybe the power to maybe manifest or they could that's a possibility but then on the other end of the spectrum if you talk about the word spirit in the buddhist view as you well know that word is not used in the same way at all a spirit mm -hmm. is an intensely suffering unbelievably suffering realm of existence and there's virtually no way in the universe a spirit can be useful so many beings are very powerful in the spirit realm but they're driven by power and man to manipulate people and to have and, and based on enormous attachment they can't be useful but there can be beings like people who hear voice let's say people who hear voices or people who um feel they're guided by certain people they could eat they could very easily they could be benign but it's more than likely they're very manipulative very harmful heavy spirits but manifesting as nice people that's a way that the buddhists would put it so to, to take them with a grain of salt but to say that there are ancestor spirits no that's not relevant really it's not, it's not the, really the point i mean in this life you're australian but last life you could have been tibetan so where's your ancestor you know i mean we yeah. change lives from life to life and we've got different connections so spirits is a, is a i mean that used by you in this but dif different way i understand it yeah. but i mean the buddhist approach is you don't need to be a, you know we tend to think in our modern culture that if somebody's disembodied they have to be holy no there are billions of disembodied beings who are actually harmful and who cause sickness and cause diseases and cause earthquakes really heavy duty dudes and they're really i mean the christians would call them devils but the buddhists would say they're in the spirit realm and they're very harmful so like you know like we you might have a karmic connection with a person who will harm you but you've also got a karmic connection with another person who happens to be in the spirit realm it could be your husband from two lives ago and because of his anger and his rage he's born as a spirit and now he tries to harm you and these spirits can even possess you and make you do things so that's a lot of that's a really common way that many people suffer terribly but some of them still can manifest as being kind or good and they're very manipulative. So we've got to be skillful and got to be wise. Just because it's disembodied doesn't mean they're holy. I mean, the Buddhist approach is that all the body suffers are people in human bodies. We don't need to have a spirit come and appear to us, rely upon some of the actual humans like the Dalai Lama. He's much more powerful than most spirits. He's got much more knowledge. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, but I do. Thank you. It's the yeah. longest answer. So to be quite skeptical yeah. about those, that certainly the Buddhist approach, be very skeptical about in those types of things in other words in the same way that you wouldn't believe everything any human being tells you but because it's a spirit or, or disembodied we tend to think oh wow they must be special which is really naive do you understand mm. no no i do thank you yes yeah. yes okay all right thank you pia that's helpful anybody else darlings nothing no other points that have come up for you anybody any old thing doesn't matter vulnerable what yes it's anna. Anna, anna sweetheart yes hello um just talking about spirits how would you recognize if 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 say you are affected by a spirit or a spirit is you know playing tricks on you or your life or through other you people mean you'd have to be hearing them talk or see them or something okay. first of all wouldn't you 
I mean, is this a real experience? I'm not trying to you to be personal, but I mean, um, people hear people talking to them. They even might in their dreams, they might see or in their own house, people come and manifest, you know, I mean, there's so many people have these experiences of spirits coming and talking to them or manipulating them or harming them or even appearing to be kind to them. Many people have this. And I know, I mean, one person I know, I remember meeting her in Puerto Rico. She was, she was really kind of seduced by it. She felt that they were very special. She felt she was being helpful to them. All these different beings would come to her her room you know some people live like this every day and have people coming in their dreams and it's like hell for some of them it's all harmful so it's fairly evident if you can hear someone talking to you i mean many people who think they're crazy the world would call them schizophrenic because they're hearing voices the buddhist view they're actually hearing voices yes actual beings in the spirit realm whom they have a karmic connection with um are, are appearing or misusing them or harming them that's really not uncommon so you'd soon know about it Okay, I haven't personally. I do know okay. a friend who does have a spirit who follows her from house to house and has there affected her child. That's, that's right. That's but he, really yeah, not he's rid himself of the spirit. Good. His ADHD Good. is gone. He's going back to school. He isn't Good. violent. Good. But yeah, yeah, not with me. That's Thank not uncommon. You. So, I mean, this is one of the things that if you go to your Tibetan doctor, they have ways of diagnosing. They can see, they can tell by the, you know, even by looking at your urine, they can tell. Is one of the ways they see of spirit of sicknesses. One of the causes of sicknesses is interference from spirits. That's what they call it. It's a very not an uncommon thing. So of course, in the modern world, we're very superstitious about that and don't believe it, you know. But this fits with the Buddhist view very much. And many, many, many people suffer terribly because of this. Yeah, it's very interesting. So this is where you know. There are all kinds of practices you can do. And so this is where if you have faith in the presence of Buddhas, by just saying the Buddha's mantras, they can protect, you know. I mean, there's all this type of talk, right? But that's up to when whether whether one has got a practice. And that's where for you, Pia, if you're working with people in this way, it's really important you have a very sound practice yourself. And you, when you do your sessions, you should invoke the presence of the medicine Buddha or whatever Buddhas you really have confidence in who can bless the people, not not and not invite these weird dudes around, you know. Yes, it's, uh, in my own in my own coaching practice, I'm not working from that side of the the, the no. framework. I'm just I'm straight up. But uh, I guess I am seeing other soul what they call themselves soul aligned, spirit aligned coaches. Yes, and, that's right. And yeah. they, they are working from this kind of framework. I think they they yes. and they do it from a place of love, it but could they be do helpful. Just, no, I know it could be helpful, but it could also, it's, I think it's dangerous. I'm not trying to be superstitious. Okay. This could be dangerous, you know? Yeah. 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 People get very carried away by it, get very kind of mystified by it, carried away yeah. into special, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable Bring. All right, darling. What else, people? Venerable Rovina, there's a question in the chat from Steve. Um, are there any Tibetan doctors that practice in Santa Fe? I know I don't think I've heard of one I'm afraid no but I um, mean we, we should check up because they're just such when there's such amazing doctors if you can meet one I know there's one just now but of course we're talking about England there's a person I just we found one a really good one in London there have to be some around Steve we should do some research into it and ask maybe we can ask it we can ask Geshe Tashi if he knows any because I mean there are certainly plenty of them I think in America and it's so good to have them local I don't know I don't I've never heard of one in Santa Fe Steve we can look into it absolutely because they, 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 you know, they, what so is they work in a, you know, anyway, so they're re, when they're really good doctors, they're truly excellent. They can really help people's bodies and their minds because of this intimate relationship between the body and the mind, you know. It's very excellent. What else, people? Nothing. No things going on for anybody. But this one of, I mean, this one of, you know, this is the one like, let's say, say take Cynthia's point. And this is where compassion is quite difficult. There's Cynthia, well, there's a friend, he's chatting away and straight away, you know, this is exactly, she's, in the, she's a perfect example of exactly what I'm saying. If Cynthia were really in touch with her own attachment and her own anger and her own kind of, you know, we've all got some kind of views, then as soon as she hears this guy talk, instead of being angry with him, this is the point, and this is why it's so difficult. This is quite advanced, actually. She'd immediately notice this is a guy with his conspiracy theories. He must have a neurotic mind. So you'd immediately have compassion for him, you know? Or even Skylar's point, when you, because I mean, the world is full of crazy people. There's no doubt about that. This is not saying people aren't suffering and aren't crazy and aren't harming. The world is full of really harming, really deluded, really crazy people. 
but because if the degree to, this is the point i suppose this is like the, the example of this guy and his mum his mum was neurotic she was deluded she was possessive she was an alcoholic she seemed a really harmful person so then the point is if he the degree he has done any work on his own mind because it's your mother it's a thousand times harder then he would have been able to have compassion realizing she's doing all this harming because she is suffering that's the part that's hard so even a small example of Skylar and a person rabbiting on about nothing you know or Cynthia's better point of the getting annoyed with this fellow you know and getting involved in it and having a conversation and then criticizing him later this is simplest the simplest example when we know our own mind that well, we won't be um, we won't be triggered by other people's pain. We'll be able to be, and that's the compassion aspect. So the first aspect, Cynthia, was simply don't have an opinion, just listen to the guy, and straight away that would have made your mind more clear, and you would have been having empathy for him. This, you think you maybe you think you know, oh, just listen to him. It's okay, the poor guy. But you didn't need by not having an opinion, you you left your mind more open, which means you could have some compassion. It doesn't mean you have to listen to him any longer. You still go, sorry, guy, I've got to go, babe. But you'd have compassion. And why compassion? Because anybody who says dumb things. Or any poor woman who's an alcoholic and is possessive of her boy, clearly the woman's suffering. But if you're so caught up in your own misery, in your own anger, like this boy, his own suffering, and of course it's your mother, she's like a red rag to a bull, all he could see was her possessiveness, her manipulation, her lying, her craziness, and all he could see was a horrible person. That's the point. You can only see, if you see a, if you haven't seen your own mind, all you see is everybody else's problems. And this is why it's so difficult just to have compassion for other people, you know, it's really hard. It implies so much inner work already, you know. So we've got, to, and that's why we've got to know where we're at. So like, you know, I, like, I, you know, I said to this guy, I said, it's like, cause if you were an alcoholic, you can't expect, you can't live around alcohol. You've got to go. If you can't handle this woman, you've got to leave. You can't, if you're, if you haven't done enough work on your own mind, if you're still, get so angry when you see your mother you can't blame your mother it's like blaming the alcohol you, you, you don't keep living around alcohol and then keep blaming the alcohol because you keep drinking it well you don't keep blaming your mother because you go crazy every time you see her you realize you can't cope so your solution is to leave but all we do is blame the other person you know we blame the mother she is crazy but if you can't handle it get the hell out of there and that's the part I tell you, I joke and I talk about, you know, how I always quote the number as the court of the United Nations, something or other, 40 percent of all women who get murdered are murdered by the, the usually the domestic It's domestic, you know. So if we had some self-awareness, which is what I'm talking about here, you'd know you can't cope with this person. You know you've got this abusive husband and you know you can't cope. So you would leave. But the, to even have enough inner strength and awareness to be a, to notice that you can't handle this husband, that already implies so much inner work. So no wonder we all get murdered. No wonder we murder each other. No wonder children murder their mothers, you know because you haven't done the work on your own mind. And all you do is see the fault in the other person, but you're not seeing that you haven't done enough work, which is, so that means that it's a wake up call. I better leave. I better get out of here. I don't, uh, the guy, you know, I'm not gonna blame him, but I can't handle his craziness, so I'm out of here. I can't handle my crazy mum, so I'm out of here. But we don't, we just stay every day and get angry and then finally kill the person or want to kill them. Look at, look at relationships in the world. I mean, they're, a, a mire of suffering, you know, close relationships. It's unbearable. It's because of attachment and anger. I'm not being, it's not even being simplistic. It's profound, you know. We have to know what we can handle. We have to know what we can handle. And this is another one now, just talking to a friend of mine. Another variation of the compassion one is the mother and children one. This is the other way around, the problem for the mother. This first one was the problem for the son, but the problem for the mother, like another, a friend of mine, she's just writing and talking about her boy, he's 17 and he's lazy, he doesn't do any work, he doesn't give any money, he's always taking money, he does no work, he's no, uh, you know, he offers nothing to the household, 
and and the father's quite strict and she keeps giving him money so that you know the father and the wife argue about it and i mean is that being kind she said you know i mean no of course it's not being kind it's being completely weak and that's the classic one of mothers and the number of times i've heard stories of you know mothers who allow they talk about on the on the thing on, on the classes they talk about the suffering of their boy and then it sounds to me when they're first telling me about it that the boy must be 10 years old and they tell me they're 37 you know i i'm out that oh my god then every single thing you're telling me is completely insane and you're putting up with this boy who does no work he pays no rent and you think oh my poor boy and you allow him to do all this you are allowing him to abuse you you're allowing him to abuse you you know but mothers and their children are a desire worse than fathers i think mothers are just suckers for their children isn't it so to have the wisdom to be clear and be firm with compassion she can see he's, he's lazy she can see he's not doing anything to you know does nothing he just borrows money doesn't do any work sleeps all day watches his videos does nothing totally self-centered but she's she she's terrified of upsetting him this is again another whole minefield for parents you know because she's a patient person and this is a type of you know a patient person who doesn't like noise doesn't like arguments some people are like that they can't stand arguments so it looks like she's being so kind but it's not being kind you know and it's her own fears that's the problem not the boy her own fear of him shouting or something you know so we've really this work to do the work on our own mind to look into our own mind and see our own fears our own attachment to comfort our own attachment to have everything lovely this is what mothers do i mean this is the classic one of the mother and the child you know it really is incredible so it takes courage to be firm and clear and have good compassion wise compassion and do something genuinely for the sake of the other person you know not just what looks like it's being kind by allowing them to take advantage of you it's a very interesting one so it's a minefield it's a minefield especially parents especially mothers i think what mary what's happening uh there's another question in the chat venerable oh, yes it's from ida um how can you develop ultimate compassion without attachment you can't i mean with i'm oh, sorry sorry of course you can but it's a practice it's sort of like how can you be how can you play bach while you can't play bach because having attachment is not playing Bach and having compassion is playing Bach. So obviously you have to start with not knowing how to play Bach, full of attachment and anger and rubbish. And then as you lessen the lessen your attachment, lessen your anger, slowly you move towards becoming compassionate. So it's a gradual process, you know. You can't have compassion with attachment. It counteracts it. Well, I mean, all of us at the moment, we do have compassion. But what we don't notice is it's it's got only a certain level because of the presence of attachment so you could argue this is the wisdom wing is consciously working every day like you know to work on your own mind to observe your own fears to observe let's say in the example of my friend and her son and then make a decision and realize it's her own attachment to her boy and her attachment to have everything lovely that causes her not to do what's wise for her boy so when it's something as direct as that and she wants to be compassionate so then her job has to be to go against the attachment and try to do something firm and clear that will end up being compassionate to the boy and be helpful so it's difficult because attachment is what pollutes our compassion and our problem in our culture we tend to think of compassion as some kind of absolute oh i'm such a compassionate person but it's only got a certain level Another example, I always think of the simple example, let's say your alcoholic brother. Well, you know, you, you brought, you, you live with your alcoholic brother all your life. So you love your brother. You knew him when he was a little boy. You know all his good qualities. You love your brother. And now he's an alcoholic. So this is the, this is the thing that's, this is very common. This is another way that compassion gets messed up by our own attachment, but we don't see it like this. So of course you have compassion for your boy, for your brother. He's harming himself, it's really clear. But what we don't see, and this is my friend with her son, what we don't see is our attachment. You see, attachment, it can be attached to anything. 
But one of the strong attachments we all have is we want everything to be lovely. Attachment can't stand problems, put it that way. So this fr friend of mine, her attachment can't stand the, the problem of her son. So she tries to make it easy. She gives him the money. She tries to be soft with him, thinking it'll make it all go away. So that with your alcoholic brother, you do have compassion. But what you don't notice is you're he's upsetting your attachment, basically. The attachment part of you has been really offended by this alcoholic brother so that's the worry part of you and the part of you that manipulates so you think about him all the time and you talk about him behind his back and you and you paint the whole picture of just this alcoholic brother all you see is the alcoholic brother so you stick your nose in you tell him about aa you tell him to do this you tell him to do that and you think it's coming from compassion but often it's coming from your attachment to make it all lovely to make all the problem go away you act like you it looks like you're being very kind but you're not being kind. You, you, you're, you're bullying your brother. You're talking about him behind his back. And you're not even, you know, you're not really helping him because he's not even asking you for help, but you're sort of forcing him. That's not kindness. That's not compassion. That's becoming because you can't handle his being an alcoholic. But we can't see that part of ourselves. We just see it's coming from compassion. And then he falls off the wagon again. Then you get mad at him. And then you think he's causing the problems with mum and dad. And he, you know, so we, we stick out. Attachment makes you stick your nose in where it doesn't belong. And it worries. It's anxious. But you get worried. You get anxious. That's all attachment. So in other words, your suffering is not coming from your alcoholic brother. Your suffering is coming from your attachment and your aversion, you know. But we don't see that. We don't see that. It's quite hard to see our own minds because we're addicted to what we see out there and we don't notice the way we're seeing it is mistaken. The way we're seeing things out there is polluted by our own rubbish. This is really quite profound, actually, but we just don't see. That's why the, the typical person in the world thinks they're a perfect person and all they do is spend all their life criticizing everybody else. That's the commonest thing we do, as if you've got no problems. That's the arrogance we've all got. We're totally blind to our own selves, you know, and that's how we can't have empathy. But as soon as you recognize your own stuff and then you see it in other people, that's the basis for empathy. And then you like, you know, like Cynthia's example of a simple example of having an opinion about some fellow, then the same with your alcoholic brother. You don't have to have an opinion. You love him for who he is. And then if you've, because you've got wisdom, you know that he might be ready for some advice, but most of the time you're not, he's not ready for advice. So you love him for who he is, but you mind your own business. You watch him like a hawk. And if he's ready for some advice, you'll help him. But you don't barge in, you know, and stick your nose in and bully him to do this and that. Not like that. that that's not helpful. That's just coming from your own junk. Not from a, you know, part of it's wishing to help him, but there's no wisdom there, you know. That's why I says, holiness, the Dalai Lama says, compassion is not enough. You've got to have wisdom. And wisdom is what you get when you work on your own mind. And you see yourself. And you, once you see yourself, you see others. And you, you've got this link. You've got this basis, you know. And that's why I, I, I use my own example. You know, I love to read all my different newspapers on, on iPad. I'm always reading the news here and there and all the different things and reading about the world and the politics and, the, you know, all the business of September 11 lately because it's the 20th anniversary and all the Afghanis and Afghani businesses. Millions of stuff to have opinions about, isn't there? Endless stuff to have opinions about. So you read it all. So the way to have opinions about it, this is the wisdom wing. Well, this is the compassion wing too. You read it, but it's sort of like, let's say, you know, it's like, it's like, you, it's sort of like you see the world as a workshop. If you're really trying to work on your own mind, if you're really trying to practice the Dharma, then everything you read will help you understand your own mind. You'll go, oh, my God, look at that attachment. Look at those delusions. Look at the result of karma. Look at that violence there. God, look at the karma of the women in Afghanistan when you've got to hide your body and you're going to be suffocated again. And, and you know, look at this and look at that. You don't just criticize. You go, that's karma. That's attachment. That's anger. That's this. That's that. It's like a workshop. And you go, thank you for showing me. And then you learn to practice even more. That's the healthy way to see the world. And then the compassion side is you go, look at all the harm these people are doing to them themselves and then you have compassion so to see the world is a great thing to do but mostly it just drags us down and we get upset and we get angry because we keep having opinions and we keep thinking these bad people and then we have a panic attack that's not helpful at all the whole world is like a workshop if you know if you let's say aren't studying how to be an oncologist then every time you hear about cancer it freaks you out doesn't it 
But if you're studying to be an oncologist, this is my point now. This is the this is this is the analogy for being a Dharma practitioner. You're, you're learning to be an oncologist. Then the whole world is full of cancer. You are so happy to see it because you're learning about cancer. That's the wisdom wing. Then it strengthens you. Every time I used to read about Mr. Trump, I'd go, there's lying, there's attachment, there's hubris, there's arrogance, there's anger. Thank you for showing me, Mr. Trump, how not to be. That's how you learn about it. Instead of pointing fingers and getting angry, you know. So like Cynthia's thing, you don't have to have an, you don't have, to, uh, have an opinion, which is anger. You observe the poor guy. My God, the guy's suffering. And you realize, and, and you go, thank you for showing me my mind. Every one of the things in Mr. Trump's behavior, I see in myself. I see attachment. I see anger. I see hubris. I see arrogance. I look in Afghanistan as just a result of karma, you know, unbelievable suffering karma. Everywhere you go, you using you see it through the lenses of karma. You see it through the lenses of Buddhist psychology. Then it becomes a workshop. Every second of life is a workshop for you. That's how you grow. And then you get more courage and more compassion. I must never give up so then I can be useful to others. Otherwise, you just go crazy. This is the point, you know. Look at this. Our hour has nearly gone like a dream. Yes, Steve. So, Venerable Rubina, to take it one step further. Yeah. Let's just say, for example, in Cynthia's discussion, it turns out that this guy is unvaccinated doesn't care, is going into, you know, is is going into a nursing home, whatever. Sure. In other words, and, he's a harmful and, person, like the world and is creating a, yeah. and creating a, a lot of yeah. harm. And yes. Before, but before you go on, Steve, before you go on, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about suffering people who are deluded and they harm others. That's Mr. Trump, that's the Afghanis, that's the wars, that's the violence, that's the rapists. That's what I'm talking about. So the first one is. You learn about your own mind, your right. delusions, and then you think, thank you for showing me. Then you go, what can I do to help? Now, Steve, if there is something you can do, honey child, do it. Mm -hmm. If you can stop Mr. Trump tomorrow, if you can stop the Afghanis harming women tomorrow, if you can stop this guy from walking mm -hmm. into nursing homes tomorrow, honey child, do it. But we can mm -hmm. see 99% of the time there's not much we right. do. So you get courage, you recognize you can't change the whole world, you have compassion. Mm -hmm. If there is something you can do, you do it. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But often we can't do it. Do you see my point, Steve? Absolutely. So you don't become passive. You learn about this. And this is the whole part. This is the tra tragedy. I mean, if you can go to Afghanistan tomorrow and make it all nice for everybody. Wow. Amazing. So the first one is learning about it, about karma mm -hmm. and the suffering. And then if there is something you can do, do it that's the point but then the next question is what if you can't stop this guy from going into the nursing homes what if you can't force this guy to be vaccinated that's then the next question isn't it what if you yes. can't what's your answer if, if there's nothing you can do yes. Yes. i think you you have to feel compassion for the victims compassion for this person and try to work on that and realize the difference between being able to take action and do yeah, something and not. That's right. But the, the real learning is you realize the suffering and you, and that's what the body suffers are energized by. I'm going to never give up continuing to become a mm -hmm. Buddhist. So then I can, can be a benefit. So you use it as grist for the mill right. for yourself to continue to practice. In other words, instead of getting you depressed and hopeless, which is what happens because the world, we can't change it. Sometimes you renew your wish to never give up working on yourself. So you continue to help whenever you can and never give up. That's the enthusiasm part. Do you understand, Steve? Yes. Thank yeah. you, Venerable Rubina. Yes. Good. Thank you, Steve. It's a really important point because much of the time we can't help. That's the tragedy. We can only do a time. You can give a piece of advice, but even advice, even if the guy's not open to advice, your words are going into deaf ears, aren't they? And that's often our problem. You know, we get so fanatic. We keep bashing our heads against brick walls. So we've got to be caring. And if there is something we can do, do it. You know, even a small thing, do it. But don't have fantasies of, ex you know, magical expectations of perfection coming, you know. So we need courage to do this because it means we're going to be facing the suffering all the time. Isn't it? We've got to be seeing it, you know. Yeah, such a good point. Venerable, there's a question from Hannah. Hannah, would you like to read your question or would you like me to? Uh, 
Okay, here's the question. You are describing my relationship with my father very well in the last three stories and what there I did. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's and like perfect. Practicing changing. What, with... what did you say, darling? I am saying it's it just perfect. This whole talk has been yes. describing the, uh, the one thing that I feel so stuck on. That's very fascinating, Hannah, isn't it? It's so universal, yeah. isn't it? Well, talk about your yeah. specific one. What, what can I say? What can I do? Say, talk about it. Yeah. Well, the the point that, because I have been practising using it as grist for the bill, mill, I've yeah. been practising recognising, well, I did recognise that the only place that I have any real sphere of influence is my own experience and my own mind and my own relationship yeah. to the yeah. scenario. He's very hurt. He's very wounded. Like As a child, I knew that he was the, the person who I knew who was in the most pain of anyone I knew right. and that he Amazing. would be the most uncomfortable person to be oh my god and he lashes out the the only issue i'm much more comfortable if it's just my dad and i right right exactly. and i do what you kind of said i probably let him talk he's yeah. he spends so much time alone that when he's with me yeah. you know it you, you listen to dad for a few hours yes. you know and i've been practicing kind of drawing the line yes. after a point Letting right. him have his say making it about him in that time yes. where yes. i get really stuck is in family gatherings yeah. Because he, he he is in a lot of pain as he lashes out like a wounded animal as That's soon right. as he's in contact exactly. with people. Yes, yeah. And I I always want to pre and you know people react to him either in fear or mm -hmm. they will fight back. Yes, yeah, right. I always protect him from other people right. and I want to protect other people from him. From him. Exactly. And that's the point that I've been right. I've been trying to use that my desire to protect yes. as grist for the bill because I just it's it's like I just can't. It's yes. too constant. He's that's he's right. not changing. No exactly. And he doesn't really want to. No exactly. That's right. But how often are there family gatherings? Okay, no you're right. They're not they're not that often. Thank God. I've, I I have been I've been avoiding them though. No, you know, I understand. The last I know, year. I mean, that's understandable. I mean, it's understandable. But this is where, I mean, already you're quite wise in what you're saying. You realize you can't change him. You realize it's like he is. And because of his own pain, he harms others. So then this is where also you've got to be brave enough to allow your other family, because they've got, I mean, the Buddhist view is they've got the karmic connection to have this man in their life. So there's some learning for them. So maybe give them the respect of treating them like adults and know that they've got to learn from this as well. You can't force them to learn, but to try and protect them from it okay it's okay but you can't really let them just learn okay. what they have to learn let them just learn what they have to learn and if they don't learn either that's their suffering as well we i mean that's something i was you know, gonna swear that's full on no, okay no you are it is i mean this is where i can see in our family like our family had like nine different human beings it was like i kind of we often joke about it because we all had our own done we, we all had our own ways of responding you know our mm -hmm. daddy was an alcoholic and so there will be this violence and dramas and every one of us it's almost like a comedy each one of the seven kids we had our own style of how to deal with it well mine i just didn't care and then if there's dramas and fights i'd jump in the middle because i was kind of quite aggressive but i wasn't quote unquote worried about anything but another system was almost comical she was so so worried the whole time you know she would try and manipulate the entire nine people to make sure there was never a problem she nearly went trying to make everything nice protecting in other words yeah. people from each other but to me i sort of let everybody do what they like and what the hell you learn from it you know so in some way i didn't suffer so much from it but she would suffer tremendously because she would feeling and this is attachment energy we've all got different yeah. attachment energy is to try and yeah. manipulate the situation she was like the peacemaker but she nearly went crazy because her aversion was to having the, the apple cart upset and she would do everything in her power to make sure daddy didn't go there so rabina wouldn't be here and if she got mummy over there then there wouldn't be a fight but she exhausted herself by trying to manipulate everything. You can't protect each other sometimes. So maybe with treating each other with respect and knowing they've got the karma to have this man in their life, they've got to learn what they've got to learn and let them learn it and love them both for who they are. Bloody hell. I mean, that really might be just a missing link because I've been stuck on this for so long and it's like, it seems like going. very strange to like be stuck. My sister. You sound like my sister trying to make, and it's just coming yeah. from kindness, but it's also coming yeah. from your attachment to make it every, to make everything lovely. Yeah. And we can't respect. Stand it. I, I can yeah. get that. I can get that respect. Yeah. The whole respect everything as it is. Let people deal. Let right. them have their dramas. Let them let your father be the way he is and, and break it. You break your heart for him and let that sister respond the way she does. Let auntie respond the way she does and love them all for who they are. And don't just add your little six pennies worth because that's just everybody jumps in the middle of the world. <laughs> you understand? Okay.
<laughs> yeah, totally. That's fantastic. I feel there's not of tension in my gut, sort of building at the thought of, of actually doing I'm this. Sure, I'm sure. <laughs> and that's great. No, that's good. It's like touching right on it. Thank you, Thank you Hannah. Thank you, darling. Mm-hmm. Perfect, perfect way to end. Okay, so it really shows us universal, isn't it? It's incredible. We're all variations of the same thing, you know. So we just have to keep being brave, and this is why Hannah also we're finished with this the more you see your neediness for everything to be lovely your attachment your fears the more you work on those the more stable you become and you can just watch all this kind of drama and love everybody and protect if you have to but love everybody for who they are and let them be the way they are and just love them you know love them love them all love them all you know that's it darling you know everybody and then continue to work like steve's point you can't you help if you can if not you just keep aspiring. I've got to keep working on myself so I can be of use to others. Never stopping, never giving up. That's the key. Well, thank you, darling ones. Very helpful again. What a useful day. Thank you, precious people. Much love. Gone like a dream. Out 60 whole minutes. But all those thoughts have gone in so we they don't go astray. We keep nourishing those seeds we planted and never giving up working on ourselves so we can help others. Thank you, precious ones. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you,